Hello, I'm Jim Deeks, and this is Canada Files, and I thank you for joining us. Our guest on this edition is Arlene Dickinson, a lady who will be familiar to just about every Canadian, but perhaps not so much to you. Arlene has been a Canadian television fixture for nearly 15 years as an expert panelist on Dragon's Den, our version of Shark Tank. But she's also an extremely successful businesswoman, philanthropist, and entrepreneur herself. How she got to where she is is a very interesting story. Eileen Dickinson, thank you for joining us. Jim, it's really great to be here. I'm looking forward to our conversation. Well, so am I. You know, I would say that just about everyone in Canada knows who you are, and I dare say that just about everyone admires you greatly, not just for your success, but also for your personality. But, you know, let's go back to around the age of 32, uh, before all this began. And I'm sure that no one at that point, and probably least of all you, had any idea of the rest of your life that was unfolding for you. Take us back to that time, about 1988, and where you were in your life and the crossroads you were looking at. Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a trip down memory lane, Jim. I, so 1988, I was just going through a divorce. Um, I had um, literally just started to uh, go into the workforce and had gotten a job uh, at a marketing company, at actually a television station uh, and, and sales, which I got fired from, and then went on to join Adventure as a partner, but that meant just coming in and working for free and getting sweat equity to, you know, in exchange. So it was, but up to that point, I had been married, I had raised four children, um, gotten married when I was 19, raised four kids, started to have my family, and everything was kind of going along, but was in a, not a great marriage for, you know, for a whole bunch of reasons, and ended up divorced and kind of alone, and no money and no, no education and no skill sets, and it was, it was quite a journey. You were raised as a member of the Mormon Church, and right at that time that we're talking about, your relationship with the church ended very suddenly. Tell us why, and did that change your faith for the rest of your life? Yeah, I was I was raised in the um, Latter Day Saints Church as a Mormon, and it was it was certainly a, a religion that I, I think taught me a lot of my values relative to you know um, my approach to people and who I am as a, a, a person. But it was I had had when I was married, I had had an affair, and uh, that of course that came out, and what happened is I got excommunicated from the church. And it was really devastating to me at the time because I just felt like, you know, there was two sides to this and I wasn't really being heard. But, you know, and that was the rules of the, of the religion. And so was excommunicated. And it did change me in terms of, you know, kind of my relationship with that church. But it didn't change me in terms of my faith and my belief in, you know, a God and my belief in, in kindness and my belief in who I am as a person. Well, as you say, you uh, got a job with a company called Venture Communications shortly after you had come to this point in your life. And within a decade, you ended up owning the company outright. And as a single mom with four kids, that is a pretty impressive achievement. How did you do in those first few months and years as a sole owner, and how did the company do? You know, I just, honestly, Jim, when I look back at that time, I just kept my head down and worked hard. Like, I, I had been given a strong work ethic. My father had always taught me that we are the result of the work we put in, you know, that things come out only when you put the hard work in. And so I was just working very hard, and it was difficult because I was making decisions on my own. But I found out that I was kind of the person. I was an entrepreneur, and I wanted to make my own choices. So while I, when I bought my partners out, it was... It was almost like freedom to decide, and also the weight of decisions came on me as well. So it's one thing to have the freedom to decide, it's another thing to have the repercussions of those decisions, and it was interesting. Well, by uh, 2007, within a decade, you had established a profile for yourself as a very successful businesswoman in Calgary, 
And at that point, you were approached by the Canadian Broadcasting Corporation to become a panelist on Dragon's Den, um, which I'm sure was uh, like manna from heaven from you for you. How did that approach from them come about, and how did you think you'd do on a panel with a, a number of formidable colleagues? When they called me, I actually, it wasn't like, like manna from heaven. I was terrified of being a t on television, and I really didn't want to do it because I was worried about how I would be judged for being on television, you know, because thinking about my appearance, thinking about at that time, my, you know, think, worried about am I too old to be on TV, all these things that go through your mind. But, um, you know, they, they called me out of the blue and asked me to audition, and my family talked me into doing the audition. I wasn't going to. And I did the audition, and then they asked me to join the show. And again, um, I wasn't going to do the show, but my kid said, Mom, what are you worried about people seeing you? Who's watching that show anyway? So nice. <laughs> it was the second, nice. yeah, famous last words. It was the second season. <laughs> well, let's talk about some of the opportunities that you have had on Dragon's Den here in Canada. First of all, how many businesses have you invested in in the roughly 12 seasons that you've been on the show? Yeah, I don't actually know the exact number, but it would be it would be in the dozens. And it's been one of those, uh, it's just been a journey. I mean, we, we do a lot of deals every year, but a lot of them fall apart through due diligence. Um, but I have successfully been an investor in, yeah, probably a few dozen. And which are some of the most successful? Oh, we've had some really great successes. Um, Chicopee Pasta is one. Um, Cook It, which is a meal kit delivery company based in, uh, out of Quebec, has done incredibly well. Uh, it started with just several millions of dollars in revenue, and now is doing tens of millions of dollars in revenue. OMG Candy, uh, Green Lid, which is a disposable uh, composting bin. I, I, there's quite a few that have gone on to do really well. And it's so great because Canadians have supported them along the way. Are there any that have failed? And if so, why did they fail? You know, there's been a few that I would say, I, I'm not sure I would characterize them as failures. There's been a few where I didn't, you know, I just got my money out or I t walked away and didn't get the investment out because the company really needed the capital and it wasn't a business that I felt was going to continue to grow. Um, but for the most part, those businesses, you know, were not run by entrepreneurs that were trying to really build something and they, and they stumbled. And, you know, that happens all the time. What was your role in these opportunities? Were you generally just a passive investor or were you getting your, your hands dirty, as it were, as an active leader? At the beginning, I was more involved um, than not with some of these businesses. And then as, the, you know, as I got into more and more businesses, it was almost impossible, not, not almost, it was impossible for me to be actively involved. Now I sit on the boards of these companies or people on my team. I've got a venture capital firm called District Ventures Capital. You know, we invest $100 million in companies like these. And, and so um, now we have a group of people that get involved, not just me. Were there some opportunities that perhaps your colleagues got into but you didn't that you wished you had? You know, there's two that I really wish I'd gotten involved in. I'm, I tried to get into them. One was a company called Core Shorts, which was a um, compression short for working out and for people to make sure they had good compression when they were working out. And the other one was a company called Saks, which was a men's underwear company. Didn't get either one of them, but I wish I had. Were there any that you got into but realized, oh boy, maybe I'm in over my head here, or maybe I was oversold? I mean, just a few that maybe you regret now? No, I don't regret any of them. I mean, there's some that I would, I think, could have gone better than they did um, had we applied more, give it, given them perhaps more help or the entrepreneur had done things a little bit differently. I mean, it's easy to lay blame and say, oh, I regret that. I don't. I, I don't regret any of them. I learned from all of them. And I got to, and because of, because of those deals on the show, that's what led me into a venture capital um, career and, and starting a, a fund. So I look at it as a great opportunity to learn. And, and these entrepreneurs did the best job they could. Could we have done things differently? Sure, we can always do things differently. 
You know, we certainly see almost in every episode of Dragon's Den, we see a deal being made, if not by you, by some of your colleagues. Do most of those deals actually go through, or do a lot of them, after, as you mentioned, due diligence, and after the show is recorded, do they fall through and not proceed? You know, I can't keep track of what the other dragons are doing with their deals because it's a handful for me to keep track of my own. Um, but what I will say is, I've like, well, not likely, I, I for sure have closed more deals than any other dragon on the show. So I know that I've closed a lot of deals. I know that I um, am very committed to trying to make sure that these deals get seen to fruition. They don't always work out. For sure, there's lots that don't. But um, yeah, I mean, people will select the dragon they want to be in business with. One of the unexpected elements of Dragon's Den that I think most viewers will be aware of is the fact that you and Kevin O'Leary, who's now gone on to Shark Tank, but the two of you were co-panelists for a number of seasons, and it was fairly obvious, even on the show, that you didn't necessarily see to eye, eye to eye on a lot of issues. Uh, Kevin has gone on to become quite a big star in America. I'm just wondering, how do you feel about his success? You know, I don't begrudge him his success. Listen, we all, we all come at capital investment differently. We all are different types of people. And I always say to people, when they're making decisions on who they want to invest in them, that you're choosing somebody like a marriage partner. So make sure you're choosing wisely. And he's going to have people that like his style, and there's going to be people that like mine. We just have very different styles. Talking about opportunities that you invest in. What do you look for in a new business opportunity? Is it simply potential return on investment or are there other criteria? Oh, you know, the ROI, the return on investment only comes after you've had success in building the business. And so I'm working hard to think of whether this entrepreneur is somebody I want to be in business with. At the end of the day, like I said, you're picking a partner. And so you want to believe that they're honest and they're genuine and that they believe in a win-win and that they have a great idea. So it's kind of this combination of the idea, sure, but there's lots of great ideas, but there's not lots of great entrepreneurs. So you're looking for somebody that you believe in. If the Dragon's Den opportunity had not come up for you 16 years ago, no, not 16, 14 years ago. Um, how do you think your life would have un unfolded differently? Oh, that's a, that's a, it's a, such a hard question to answer because who knows? I, I think if somebody had asked me if I'd be here today, I would have said, hey, it's highly improbable, but I would have said it's not impossible because I really believe that we make our own pass and that if you're prepared to take the risk and open doors that are unexpected or things like I said I didn't want to go on the show at the beginning but I got you know I, I told myself because my kids thought I should that I should try to show them that you should try anything um, if you're given an opportunity give it a shot so I don't know where I would be today but I like to think that I still would be trying to make a difference in our country and, and that is what matters to me maybe not through television but I always have wanted to be an actress, so hey, who knows? Maybe I would have started an acting career, Jim. Who knows? <laughs> I'm sure you would have been a huge success. You know, oh, you started with the Dragon's Den in 2007, and your life seemed to be going along just peachy until 2013. And at that point, there was a natural disaster that happened in Calgary, your hometown, and it seemed to trigger a major crisis for you personally. Tell us what happened and what happened to you. Yeah, there, there was the, it was the flood that happened in Calgary that you're referring to. And, and, and it was the largest natural disaster that had happened in Canada. And I was busy doing so many things. And I had my marketing company, Venture Communications, was running. And somebody else was running it. And I was busy doing many other things. And the flood hit, and it literally almost put the business out of business. And so I went through this whole period of reckoning, you know, like this was the company that had brought me up. This was the company that employed a bunch of people that I cared deeply about. And it wasn't because that was where I made my livelihood anymore because it wasn't. It was because I felt this innate responsibility to 
make sure it survived. And through that, I reinvented it. And I, I wrote the book um, as a result of that on reinvention and, and what we can do when we believe that we have something that we want to ensure doesn't just disappear simply because waters rush in and, and potentially you know, ruin something doesn't mean that there isn't something left that you can um, have rise from, from that disaster. And that, that's the lesson I learned. Well, to your credit, following that disaster, uh, you've applied your expertise and your success into new business ventures that have uh, basically focused on assisting and underwriting entrepreneurs, particularly in the health and food and beverage sectors. But I, I want to ask you, actually, about your writing, about your books. You've written three books and the last of which, as you just mentioned, is a, a book called Reinvention, Changing Your Life, Your Career, and Your Future. Was this a subject that your publisher came to you and said, hey, Arlene, we could probably market this if you're willing to kind of help co-write it, or was it something that you went to your publisher and said, I really would like to write a book on this theme? No, it was a topic that I had selected and had went to my publisher and said, I, I, I think I have something to say here. Um, because it's, it, it's easy to get in a trap where you feel that you have to write book after book and you don't necessarily believe in, in what you're writing about. But this was, my books, I really focused on what I care deeply about. Um, and this reinvention had struck home for me because it's hard to be seen as a successful person you know, on television and in the world, and then have something major happen and have to admit that that happened, that actually is seen as a failure. And it wasn't my fault that the flood happened, but you know, these were things that were impacting my business. So I went to the publisher and t we talked about it and they've been, they've been such um, a great group. It's, it's Harper Collins. They were great to me and they said, absolutely, let's, let's talk about this. And so I, we undertook the book, it was great. So what is the overall premise? You kind of touched on it, but what is the premise of the book? Should everybody reinvent themselves or think about doing that? Yeah, the premise is that people sometimes wait for something tragic or, or a disaster to happen in their life before they reinvent themselves. You know, they're not happy with their life, but they wait for something to trigger, like a divorce or a flood or a, a job loss or, you know, all these things and then we and then when those things happen we stop and go wait am I happy with my life is this an opportunity for me to rethink everything and the book is about not waiting for those moments in, of that force you into reinvention but for really assessing your life and determining whether you can take the steps necessary to reinvent yourself into the life that you really want to have because my the hypothesis is that many of us are living lives for other people's sake and not for what things and not doing things that really fulfill us as humans. You know, it would appear from your background and your career history that you really haven't had to struggle very much. It's uh, since the age of 32, you've had a pretty charmed time and uh, all credit to you. It's not that you've been lucky. Um, but as a woman in business in Canada, you are, I'm sure, very aware of the fact that the glass ceiling still exists and wage disparity between men and women still exists. I'm sure you talk to, talk to a lot of young women. What's the advice you give young women who are determined to be successful in business? Uh, I, I want to say one thing. Um, I haven't led a charmed life that way. I have been in special loans at the bank. I have been close to bankruptcy numerous times. I have been in a place where I have suffered deep depression and had anxiety. I, there are, I, I think, you know, I've always said to people, how you see people on the outside is not necessarily what they're going through on the inside. And so, you know, part of success is living the life you want to live and getting where you want to get, get to by having a life that's filled with purpose. And that's the advice I would give to anyone, any young woman who's thinking about her career, I'd say, find what your purpose is. Because once you find your purpose, as you go through these highs and lows, and you're going to, you're going to go through these big hills and these valleys, and you're going to feel ecstatic, and you're going to feel depressed. And when you do those things, that is the journey. And, and as long as you're on that path because you're aimed for, aiming for your purpose in life, 
your why, why you're getting out of bed every day, why are you doing what you're doing, then you will find success because that is what success is. It's living your life with purpose. And, and so I would tell them that everything's going to be okay, that when you're at your low, that things are going to get better, you know, like no matter what, they are going to be okay. And um, I can tell you that there's times when I didn't think I could get out of bed. But when I got out of bed, I realized that it wasn't as bad as I thought it was, that I could get through it. And I would say that's the advice I'd give to any young woman. You can do this. Let me ask you about entrepreneurs. You've uh, obviously, for the last 20 years, spent a lot of time with entrepreneurs. Do you find that Canadian entrepreneurs are different from American entrepreneurs in the sense that I think most of us have the impression that Americans are perhaps more willing to take risks than Canadians and perhaps are more willing to invest in new ideas than Canadians. Do you agree with that assessment? Yeah, I'd say that as a society, um, Canadians are taught that we should have low-risk lives we're taught that there's a safety net for us, which is the, the beauty of Canada, the social, the social support we have, which is a healthcare system, which is education, which is all the things that Canada gives us, also gives us a security that doesn't really invite risk. And so Americans, um, they are more about the individual dream. They're more about the individual quest. Canadians are more about the social dream and the social quest to have a, a community and a society that is equal and better for everybody. Now, that, I think, that social side of what Canadians are does kind of bleed into whether or not entrepreneurs are as brave, whether they're supported as much by other Canadians. You know, the tall poppy syndrome is real. And so, yeah, I think what we're coming out of that, I think Canadians are getting braver. I think we're starting to believe in ourselves more. I think we're understanding that you can be entrepreneurial and take risk and not also in some way be harming society, but in fact contributing to society. And that those things aren't opposite ideas, that you know, being good for society and running a business, capitalism and you know, capitalism with a heart, those two things can live together. And that's where I think Canada is very different than America. We really do have a compassion and an empathy that drives a business value. What's the biggest mistake entrepreneurs make? I think it's underestimating the time, energy, and money it's going to take to be successful. You know, people think I've, I've had to start it for a couple of years and it hasn't hit yet. Well, startups are, you know, seven years generally before they start to really gather steam. So you've got to be in it for the long haul. And I, so I think they, there's an underestimation of the work that's involved. And then the other mistake I think many make is they, and this may be a Canadian thing, but we're not dreaming big enough. We're not pushing far enough. We're not, you know, we're not striving for the, the, the big goals. And so we temper our ambitions. And, and I, I've seen other um, entrepreneurs do that, where, especially females, where they will temper their ability to, to really grow. And, and we have to get past that. And that's what I would say to entrepreneurs, reach hard, reach high. Well, as somebody who has reached hard and reached high, uh, I wonder what's ahead for you. You're approaching an age when most people are thinking about retirement. And you've achieved phenomenal success You've achieved uh, and uh, received many honors. You've got four honorary university degrees. Is it now time for you to maybe sit back and smell the roses? I can't imagine. I love what I do so much. I mean, my biggest fear is that I'm going to run out of runway, not that I need to slow down on the runway. I, I love what I do, and I, I get so much joy out of helping businesses in Canada be successful. Being successful as a result of that is, is just a, it's icing on the cake. So I'm going to continue to raise a, a, I'm going to continue to raise capital. I'm going to continue to invest in Canadian companies. I'm going to continue to believe that age is not a barrier to success. Um, I, I'm proudly, I'll be 65 this year. Probably by the time this uh, airs, I'll be 65. I love the age I am. I'm proud to be my age. Um, it sure beats whatever's in second place. And, uh, and so, yeah, why do we need to be ageist? I think as long as we're contributing and as long as we're happy and as long as we 
are allowed to be all we can be, that's, that's happiness, that's joy to me. I ask this question of all our guests, and I ask it to you in the context of a woman who has become truly self-made, thanks to living in this country. What does being Canadian mean to you? Oh, it means, it means freedom and peace. It means, um, it, me it means the, it means opportunity in a, in the context of a community. And, and I get back to what I said earlier. It means to me being Canadian, I'm an immigrant to this country. I can't imagine living anywhere else. And I've been all over the world. I, it, it's just this, this place of freedom and peace and opportunity and community. And it means home to me. It's just, it means home. Well, Arlene, you set a very high bar for Canadian women to emulate. And thank you so much for sharing your time with us on Canada Files. Jim, it was an absolute pleasure. You've given me a lot of memories and a lot to think about. And I always love interviews that make me think harder. So thank you for that. You're very welcome. And thank you for joining us on Canada Files. We hope you'll do so next time. The preceding program was made possible through the generous support of Alice and Ted Kernahan, as well as the following donors. The Browning Watt Foundation, Nona MacDonald Heeslip, Joe and Marie Heffernan, Michael and Mary Ellen Hogan, Donna and Richard Ivey, Richard and Gail McGraw, the Bruce H. Mitchell Foundation, the North Pine Foundation, Eleanor and Francis Shen, the 63 Foundation, John and Margaret Deeks, Wendy Deeks, in memory of Peter A. Deeks, and by the Central Canadian Public Television Association.